What's up everybody? Welcome back to another video on my channel. My name is Dion and you're watching Reptiliatus. Friends, today we are in for a rare treat. Emphasis on the word rare because we are actually at my friend Alex's place and you would also know him as Dr. Brown, the veterinarian who is responsible for treating all my animals that need medical intervention or care. You hear that? That's uh, one of the animals we're gonna be learning about today. Alec actually is a passionate hobbyist himself, not just by profession. He has a very unique and very cool collection of animals here in his reptile man cave, we'll call it. <laughs> oh, what should we call it? He has a very organized and beautiful collection of animals here behind me. And one of the most important things I would say is that he's breeding one of the most rare gecko species in the world, Ligodactylus williamsi, electric blue day gecko. And today he's gonna give us a tour behind me and show you exactly how it is that he's produced over a hundred of these animals. Hi, so uh, I'm Dr. Alec Brown, a, a vet at Campus of States Animal Hospital. You might have seen me in a couple of Diane's other videos, put a playlist up here. I see a lot of reptiles there, including Diane's, and we certainly like to do that. Uh, so we're here at my house just taking a look at some of the reptiles that I keep. Pretty similar story to I think most people out there. Started when I was very young looking for frogs and garter snakes and stuff like that in Ontario and then progressively wanted to see more of them. Tried taking them home for a couple days and then releasing them. Not that we recommend that nowadays. And then kind of have had, oh I don't know, dozens if not hundreds of species between then and now over, over 25 years or so. I inherited a bearded dragon from somebody who was five or so years old. Kept him for another six or seven years until he passed, unfortunately. But he was, I think, 11, 12 by the time he passed. In that time, I got another couple bearded dragons and, and bred them for a couple summers. Very bad financial decision, but interesting, and I liked keeping them. It was kind of another challenge to make sure that I was keeping them well enough so that they were happy enough to breed. From there, I kind of moved into a place where I had less room, so I got into leopard geckos where I could keep them in kind of stacked cages, which is a lot easier without as much lighting compared to the bearded dragons. Not that I recommend that now. Learn some more things about UVB and the needs that, that other species like leopard geckos have. And I had them for another few years, bred them for a few years as well. Again, another poor financial decision. Pretty expensive to keep them and you don't sell them for very much, but it's kind of a passion project. After that, I got a little bit into some dart frogs, which I really liked, but my house was a bit cold and so I moved away from there. And now I'm really focusing on little micro geckos and dart frogs again. I really have no interest in handling them. For the most part, reptiles don't enjoy it. They can tolerate it, be okay with it, but I don't think they're getting anything out of it. It's so I just like to have them as kind of species that I can watch, like a little display tank, and really the plants in the enclosure are probably more important than the animal itself for me. So we've got tiny little lizards that I can keep in cages that are pretty big for their species, so we know they have lots of enrichment opportunities, places to move around, and that are brightly colored in out in the day. Don't like having a lizard in there that you can't really see very often. Legodactylus williams eye, kind of what I've settled on mainly. Also have some Felsuma clemeri, very similar size, similar animal. They're like a striped, but you'll see them later on. And then the dart frogs too. Olfago pumilio right now, and hoping to get some histrionica, but that's a very difficult thing to do in Canada, so we'll see how it works. To talk about the Williams Eye a little bit more, they're a CITES 1 animal, so you can't import them or export them internationally at all. The only exception might be zoos or something like that. It's a bit of a tragic story. I think we, we found them a few decades ago, but then something like 10 to 20% of their population was exported, like for the pet trade, and their population crashed. So they're only in like an eight square kilometer region in part of Africa, Tanzania. So they're really not doing well there, and then thankfully the governments have kind of stepped in and made it very difficult for them to be captured in the wild anymore. But fortunately, they're really easy to breed in captivity, we've found. So I've bred something like a, probably a couple hundred by this point over the last few years and selling them within Ontario mainly, some other places. But we've got a, quite a few, typically like 10 hatchlings at a time, something like that, and three or four females. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so this is the uh, first of two Williams Eye tanks that I have. I've got one male and two females in there. Both are laying eggs pretty well in the summer. They're kind of slowing down now in the winter. I've changed the lights so that they're off for more like 13 hours a day and on for 11 hours a day compared to the opposite during the summer months. Very heavily planted. I find that makes them do pretty well. They feel a lot more secure and then they come out more as well. I think if they think that they can escape pretty easily, then they're a lot more likely to show themselves. I think that there's an out. A lot of basic plants in there, so it was a pretty cheap tank to put together, relatively speaking to the other two, but densely planted. I've got one 75 watt basking bulb and then a T5 high output UVB, along with just a, an LED bar or some kind of shop light, depending on where in the room. Ideally, I like to keep the basking temp up on the stick here at around 90 to 100 Fahrenheit, and then the rest of the cage somewhere in the 70s most of the time. I think a lot of people keep them too cool, and then getting to the hatchlings, they're the same way. We need to keep them pretty warm and it can't be too humid all the time. So there's no covering on the vents at the top. They're fully exposed. So it does dry out at least in the top half of the tank every day. So feeding them is one of the biggest reasons that I keep this species compared to a lot of other reptiles. I feed Pangea pretty much every other day, rotating between the different kinds. Uh, right now I think they have watermelon in there use a lot of with insects and some of the papaya as well. And then I always have a little dish of calcium available too. I do see the females in particular going to eat out of there, especially when they're producing a lot of eggs. I think a few years ago when we first started keeping these guys, they would crash pretty early on, the females, because they just didn't have enough calcium. Whereas I have a, this one here has been breeding for I think five years and it's doing very well from what I can tell. And then aside from the gecko diets, stuff like that. We also give them live insects, typically once a week or so for the adults. Anything small they would eat. I don't like a lot of crickets because they make noise and they smell and they escape. So I have bean beetles and fruit flies. The fruit flies I can feed to the, the smaller geckos as well. So that makes it convenient. And I dust them every time as well with calcium, multivitamin, that sort of stuff. Hey everybody, today's video is brought to you by HelloFresh. I'm here with my sister Nura, and I wanna let you guys all know that when I'm not at home working with my animals, editing videos, I'm usually over here spending time in my family's place with them. And one of the things our family loves doing, especially this one, is cooking. With HelloFresh, you get fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Count on HelloFresh to make your home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. One of the things I love about HelloFresh is the very easy to follow cooking instructions that they provide for each meal kit. You could have zero experience cooking and know exactly what to do following these. What I love about HelloFresh is with my incredibly busy schedule, this simplifies meal making and makes it efficient and fast. We're gonna cook this delicious meal in 35 minutes. I'd like to see anyone try and do that, having to go to the grocery store and buy it all and bring it back home. It takes too long. I have so much work to do at all times. I love that I can just pull the kit out, prepare it, and be eating in 35 minutes. As someone who cares deeply for the environment and loves nature, one of the other things I love about HelloFresh is their commitment to being sustainable. Not only is their entire packaging made of already recycled, sustainable materials, paper-based, they're also committed to neutralizing their carbon footprint, which is super awesome. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code Reptiliatus16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. I wanna take a moment to sincerely thank HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now it's time for me to get a good, delicious meal in my body and get back to editing. Thank you. All right, so in this tank we have a pair of the Williams Eye, one male and one female. The female, I had her quarantined for a little while because she lost part of her tail a few weeks ago. Not sure exactly what happened, but I didn't see the tail on the ground. Wondering if the male bit it, or maybe she got it stuck somewhere. I know sometimes they get stuck between the egg tubes and the glass, but it's been growing back pretty well now, and you can see it. It looks a bit strange. I've never had an adult lose her tail like this, 
but when the hatchlings do, you can actually barely tell the difference when it comes back. Very different from most like leopard geckos, fat tail geckos, that sort of thing. Not very noticeable. We find in the wild, they only live on one specific kind of tree called the screw pine. And typically there's about one male on the tree and any number of females and sometimes some hatchlings as well. So they can kind of work like that with, with a group of multiple females per male. To help collect the eggs, I have these flower tubes in there about a half inch diameter for the opening and maybe three or four inches long. Get them on Amazon or a lot of flower shops. And if I provide those, then the females will lay their eggs in there as long as there's nowhere better. If they find a little nook or cranny somewhere else in the cage, they often go there. So that's why I don't have a very complicated background, no cork tubes or anything like that. They love to lay in those places. And then you can't take the eggs out, which means you can't incubate the eggs. And most of the time that means they hatch out as male because it's a bit warmer than the females need to incubate. Uh, so we find most geckos and I think most turtles and tortoises as well undergo temperature sex determination when they're incubating. So for lizards, geckos in particular, higher temperatures mean more likely male offspring. Lower temperatures more likely female. That will also determine how long they incubate. The lower the incubation temperature, the longer they take to incubate higher the temperature, the shorter they incubate. In the cage, they often lay pretty close to the top, or it's in the 80s Fahrenheit, sometimes even above that. And that means it's most likely we get male lizards, which is why we see way more males in the hobby than females. And then the females, I, I incubate them at around 76 Fahrenheit in the day, and then a drop to 72 Fahrenheit at night to try to make more females, but still some males, so that we don't have just one sex in the hobby. All right, so for today's question of the day, what do you think is a species that we need more of in captivity? Let us know in the comment section down below. Fantastic question, Alec. As always, your comment will get a heart and hopefully we can engage in a conversation. And this is a very important topic, so definitely give your ideas. So we've got the hatchling cages up here. I typically keep two together or maybe just one only clutch mates, so if they two hatch at the same time, we'll put them in there. Um, it's all custom acrylic. It's going very well. I think I just spun a leak in one of them that I'll have to address, but they've been running for about a year now, going well. So in each of the cages, we've got some bamboo poles just for them to hide on. They do the squirrel thing where they go around the opposite side, feel safer like that. Some of them, the thicker pieces have a hollow center and I plug that out because they really like to go in there and then it's tough to get them out again or sometimes they could get stuck. So I put a piece of paper towel or silicone in there. And then I, I put live plants in all of them. Really seems to be hit or miss whether they survive or not. Some of the creeping fig in this tank has exploded. A couple other tanks it's going quite well. Some of the tanks didn't grow at all and it's all crispy and dead. I've got a little tiny phyllodendrons in a few of them that are going quite well slow growers but they're doing well and then a little feeding dish pangea in there and then i feed them uh, fruit flies every day helps them grow i find so in each of the cages i've got a full mesh along the top for ventilation really small holes to prevent the fruit flies from getting out and then a t5 high output bulb 10.0 so mad i think is the brand or arcadia 13 percent and then I have these little halogen puck lights at the back. Extremely hard to find in Canada. They're in the States at Home Depot, but Canada I had to look for months probably before I found some on Marketplace. Keep them exactly the same way as the adults. And that's the important part. I took a lot of the care from Frank Payne in the States, who's made thousands of them, I think. But hotspot 90 to 100 Fahrenheit, high ventilation, and then they do need the misting frequently for the water. And then on each cage, I have a label got the hatch date, when they were laid, when they're ready to go, which is the eight week mark. I typically sell them as long as they're doing well. And then which pairing they are, TJ from this one or KS from the other, how many lizards are in each enclosure and how long they incubated for. So if they didn't incubate for very long, then we may be more suspicious for a male and some people are looking for that. That's probably the toughest part about these guys is just keeping them when they're babies. They're so small, so they escape really easily, which is why it's all completely sealed up. It's important to cover the back of the exoterrace if you use those, which most people do. They're really fragile and they can really crash in a day even. So making sure that they're always getting water, always having heat, being fed is important. I never touch them. I've touched a couple of them accidentally when they were not doing so well and those both passed away, probably from whatever was making them not do well in the first place, but they're really fragile. Okay, so we'll give them some fruit flies here. 
a lot of the time I dust them, but today I'll just put them in here. And then I'm just gonna shake them out until there's a bunch in there. Sometimes they eat them right away, but this small one, I think there were some fruit flies left over, so might not. It's hard for me to put into words the magic that was the experience of visiting Alec and seeing these geckos. They are so critically endangered in the wild and seeing how many offspring Alec had thriving, his breeding pairs, is a true testament of the power of conservation through captivation that we as a community can implement and help contribute to conservation. It was also quite the treat to see many of the Ufaga localities that he was keeping and the beautiful vivariums that they were being kept in. So many interesting plants growing in them and they are really thriving. He's actually producing quite a few of these animals and uses UVB for all of them too, which is fascinating. We also went upstairs and took a look at his breeding group of Felsuma clamere, a small species of the day gecko genus that he is also readily breeding. Awesome to see, same sort of system implemented that is working really well for him. Okay, so this is the most exciting tank. Uh, if you look really closely, you could probably see some springtails, but otherwise nothing else in there. So just really growing out right now. Built it from uh, Troy Goldberg's YouTube videos recommending on how to build the glass, the custom size really. Just got a whole bunch of bromeliads in there and a couple of the phyllodendron and a couple of anthurium as well. This one and the one beside it that's just in being built mode right now are hopefully for the histrionica in the next few months. If not, then probably some other kind of dart frog in there, depending on how things go. It's kind of growing out right now, still in the dying off process, but it looks like most of the, the plants are doing okay. All right guys, I wanna take a moment to sincerely thank Alec for having me over to see these incredible animals and show you what a special project and passion he has going on, especially with the Ligodactylus and well, some really cool fog as well. I'm really excited to be able to maybe come back and show you how things progress with the custom enclosures and the amazing animals that he's planning to have housed in them. But really, yeah, this has been an incredible tour. It's nice to be in your home instead of only in the, the vet office. Well, not to say that's not an awesome time as well, getting to see you, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks.